My name is Melissa Kane. I'm a journalist and a lawyer, and I'm really excited to be your moderator for this program. Today's guest is a longtime GOP strategist and now an ardent critic of the Republican Party. He's the best selling author of Everything Trump Touches Dies, and his new book, Running Against the Devil A Plot to Save America from Trump and the Democrats from themselves, is uh, he's, in, in that book, he makes the case that 2020 is the Democrats' election to lose, much like 2016. He argues that President Trump needs to be fought by a certain type of campaign and a certain type of candidate, and that people like Bernie Sanders aren't necessarily the ones who can win this year. So we're going to spend the next hour talking about Trump and politics and Twitter and more. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Rick Wilson. Thanks so much, Melissa. I'll even point out, what is it, number four now in the New York number, Times bestseller list? It premiered at number four on the New York Times bestseller list. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 everything Trump Touches Dies premiered at 14 and went to number one. So let's knock on wood here, because I will tell you something. Saying you're a New York Times number one bestselling author never gets old. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I had to do something tonight I haven't had to do before, as I do Commonwealth Club events all the time. And tonight I actually had to go to the organizers and ask um, about the cursing policy, because there's a lot of cussing in here, as we say in the South. Uh, and, but but I th I, that's not a criticism. I think it's partly because you're so passionate about this topic. So sure. tell me why, why you felt like it was really important to write this book. It's clear that you feel very strongly about what you have to say. Well, one of the things, that, and one of the ways I write like I write, and, and the publisher in Australia who just bought the book, Rights in Australia, sent me an email. He referred to me as a foul-mouthed modern Machiavelli. I'm like, you could not have paid me a higher compliment. <laughs> um, but I wrote this book because for 30 years I was part of a system. And I helped build a system that methodically took apart the Democrats' bench all over the country. We won over 2,000 seats over 20 years, about 1,000 of them during Obama. We took apart state legislative control by Democrats, one state at a time. We now control 38 state legislatures, and that's got a big impact on the way the country looks. I know how this system works because I helped build it. I know how this system works because I operated inside of its walls for a very long time. I also know that while Donald Trump is a moron, surrounded by a constellation of other morons, like a gravitational black hole of morons, there are a lot of people around Donald Trump who are like me, who are not mouth-breathing guys like Corey Lewandowski and Brad Parscal, who are actual smart math guys, and who are smart writers, and good statisticians, and good voter turnout people, and who know this business, and they are stuck with him. It is ride or die for these guys. And I know what they're going to do. And I know the tricks they're going to use on the Democratic Party to drag them into the stupid. This book is in two major parts. The first part is to frame what a future of Trump and beyond looks like. And if it doesn't scare the shit out of you, I haven't done my job. Mm -hmm. And it should. It's bad. And the second part is to explain how those systems work, how those tricks work, how to beat them, how to run against them, how not to fall into the culture war traps that Republicans have used for generations now to pluck away moderate and independent leaning Democratic voters from, from, from what should be a set of constituencies that can put together a winning electoral college map in 2020. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, you spend the first part of the book talking about what a second Trump term would look like, painting a pretty gruesome picture of President Trump without, if you can imagine, some restraints um, based on the idea that he needs to get reelected. But take that, take that off the table, and then we have a president who you argue is, you know, unrestrained. Sure. And there are a number of passages here, you guys. It's really there's just a lot in this book, but there's so many that I just sort of wrote next. Ouch. Next to. Um, for the Trump crime family, the next four years will be a lavish opportunity to extort every last thing they can get out of everyone who comes on their political radar. He also writes, in the second term, foreign and domestic powers will start cashing in their chits, and the losers will be the American people. Can you talk a little more about what are the, the issues that come into play with a second uh, Trump sure. presidential term? Well, one of the things that we've discovered about Donald Trump is he finally has his Roy Cohn. And Bill Barr has built a set of structures for Trump, legally speaking, and a defense mechanism for Trump, legally speaking, where he is unaccountable, where there is nothing to stop Donald Trump 
from the rape and pillage that he would like to engage in. And this man is driven by three big things. He's driven by personal venality. He's greedy. He's a grasping, greedy little man. He's driven by his enormous, gigantic, and fragile ego, where he constantly has to have more affirmation, more love, more approval. And he's, and he's finally driven by this sense of, of, of aggrievement and transgression that he wants to act out. He wants to break all the rules. He wants to get away with things. He wants to commit crimes and brag about it. And then the second term, what's to stop him from doing whatever he wants? Not Bill Barr, not the Department of Justice, and frankly, Congress is we're gonna demonstrate right now that under the grasp of Mitch McConnell, the Senate will let him get away with anything he wants. And when a criminal gets away with something, they don't think, wow, I'm sure, I'm sure lucky I got away with that. I better not do any more criming. They do more. And he will do things that, that please all those three characteristics in his head that are so dark and so troublesome for a president. But he will also do things that start to frame the system so that his kids inherit the power he has accrued. And if you don't think the imperial Trumps are gonna be a thing, it, they are. And, and I write about this because there are a lot of folks, folks in the Senate, a lot of Republicans in, in and out of the Senate, Nikki Haley, Marco Rubio, Josh Hawley, Ted Cruz, these people all think I'm gonna be the one who inherits Trumpism. I'm gonna clean it up and put a new coat of paint on it and it'll be a little bit softer around the edges. It won't be quite as ugly and it'll be great. Horseshit. Those people, are going to get their heads kicked in because Don Jr. is going to be the Republican nominee in 2024, win, lose, or draw. The Republican Party is the Trump of cult, or the cult of Trump. It is not about ideas or principles or philosophies or anything else. It's about Donald Trump. And so you give them four more years there, and the 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 the, the, the badness is going to iterate out over all kinds of aspects of American life. Well, not to mention, you know, the potential for at least one Supreme Court justice, if not more, um, mm -hmm. resigning uh, from the bench and having to and getting to be replaced. Uh, sure. and so and there are a number of a number of issues. But you point out that the Republican Party is changing, and actually, in the book, you argue that it, it's an opportunity for Democrats to come in of and course. try to claim some of the of the values that that you say that that the Republican Party has abdicated. In 2018, there were Democrats who were to the right of the Republican opponents on trade and taxes. What, what world are we living in where, where a Katie Hill is more conservative in terms of how taxes are, are, are raised than her Republican opponent? It's beyond. What, what world are we in when Democrats are the, are the folks arguing for free and open trade? And they've got this opportunity to also become and this is a, uh, uh, the, from the era of Reagan forward, one of the strategic advantages of the Republican Party was that we were considered the party of national security. We were considered the party that was gonna be cold-eyed and tough and look out ahead and not let the Russians get a march on us and not let the world fall apart. We were the guarantors of the, you know, the, the legacy of the Cold War. Donald Trump, basically hears a foreign dictator call his name and hikes his skirt and says, hey, sailor, this is a guy, this is a guy who has beclowned himself with Vladimir Putin and Erdogan and, of course, Kim over and over again with their lovely letters and their deep love for one another. And so the Democrats actually have a chance to get back and be the party that killed bin Laden and to reclaim some of the mantle of the National Security Party because Donald Trump is putting this country at enormous risk by abandoning our alliances, by shredding our relationship and our reputation in the world, and by sucking up to these people who an, who an ordinary Republican or Democratic president would dismiss as autocrats and thugs. Well, but so how are Democrats doing? I mean, if there's an opportunity to step in sure. and sort of try to bridge the gap on issues like security and trade, um, I'll just, I want to read you a, a, one of your own <laughs> quotes. Uh, it says here, um, 
he's talking about uh, sort of what are the, what's the Democrat strategy and should you go with a moderate versus someone super progressive? He says, by all means, if you want to reelect Trump, treat the very real cohort of moderate, centrist, and even, I know you're shocked to hear these words exist together, conservative Democrats like outcasts. If you want to know why the GOP beat your asses sideways across the South and West, it's not racism, it's that you piss off 25% of your own base over and over and the GOP scoops them up. Are the Democrats poised to continue that? Well, if you want to have Walter Mondale 2.0, put Bernie Sanders on the ticket, you lose 45, 44, 45 states. It's just how it's going to go. And I don't say that from any ideological, like, you know, animus towards Bernie. It's just, if I was still doing what I used to do, and Bernie's the nominee, I'm going to do the victory dance of all time. I'm going to go on a Vegas bender for the rest of the campaign, and I'm going to light it up because Bernie is the perfect foil for Donald Trump. He's an 87-year-old communist from Vermont. He comes across as a guy who's like the uh, professor of socialist poetry and interpretive dance at Bennington Community College. <laughs> and the Republicans will turn him into this clown figure like you've never seen before and blow him out. Now look, I am not trying to pick the Democratic nominee. I'm not telling Democrats in this book, change this or that policy. I'm telling them that policy in this campaign doesn't matter. Policy is, at best, at best, it's a trap. You write a 600-page healthcare plan, and I'm going to put my nerds to work on it. I'm going to make them read it, because I'm not going to read it. And they're going to find 10 things in there that I can make ads about and scare the crap out of those moderate voters. I can scare the hell. So, the, like, Medicare for all. It sounds great. Everybody loves it. On, like, they hear it, they go, Medicare for all sounds really good. Well, guess what? In that plan, and the Republicans immediately found this thing, Oh, it's going to take away private health insurance. Well, that's one thing. That sort of scares the suburban vote. But then they found out most union members are covered not by some amorphous health care plan, but by a private health care plan. You tell those male Democratic union members in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, you're going to take away their private health insurance. Try that. Give that a run. And so I want to emphasize the most fundamental point of the book. All re-elections are a referendum on the incumbent, all of them, every time, from dog catcher to president. This is a referendum on Donald Trump. It is not a choice about policy. It is a choice between whether you want this guy for four more years or something else. And the something else in the minds of most voters in this country doesn't really matter. It's got to be somebody who isn't him. You've got a huge advantage built in right there that 60% of this country would not pee on this guy if he was on fire. <laughs> they hate him. Now, the problem is the election is not held nationally. A lot of those people that hate him are here. We know how California is going to vote. Hate to say it, election's over here. Honestly, I thought one, like, sort of a subtitle of your book could have been, like, don't spend a penny in California. Correct. Uh, because I like, just repeatedly said. Uh, look, there are, there are I, I, in the book, I outline about 15 states that are in play. Really, about six or seven of them are really in play. But you've got to play the calculus, of, a multivariate calculus in case, you know, Trump rolls up in Ohio or Florida early. You've got to play the game of electoral college math. I know how Mississippi will vote. It ain't going to change. I know how South Carolina is going to vote. It ain't going to change. I know California Oregon going to vote. It ain't going to change. Those 15 states, and particularly the big ones, Florida, Florida, and Florida, and also Florida, and my home state of Florida. Where do you live? Uh, it's Rick Florida, Wilson? actually, huh. um, with uh, 29 beautiful, beautiful, <laughs> shiny electoral college votes. Um, but also the states that Hillary Clinton, when they got sideways by Comey, and they got distracted and took their foot off the gas in Wisconsin, and Ohio, and Pennsylvania, and Michigan, and Donald Trump snuck into those states and won by 77,000 votes. He won by 105,000 votes over four states, throw Florida in the mix. This is a game of small numbers. This is a game, why, this is why you have to focus so intently, so carefully, so extraordinarily, with so much extraordinary discipline on running the campaign that you have to run in the states you have to run it in with the voters you have to talk to. But, but if you're a Democrat and you're trying to win the primary, how are you going to be able to be as potentially moderate as you need to be to win those sure. sweet, those those important electoral college states and get the nomination at the same time? If you look at look, folks it, it, like Amy Klobuchar, like she's not doing that. Great. It's a built-in. It's a built-in conflict. Mm -hmm. It really is. And 
even before Trump, both sides incentivize the edges for their, for their nomination process. Both sides incentivize somebody from the outer edge. Now Trump, because he was this completely transgressive figure, um, didn't really count ideologically speaking. Trump doesn't have an ideology, he has a personality. Um, he, doesn't have a, he doesn't have any philosophical underpinnings for anything. He just, he's told occasionally like, oh, the, the wingers like this or that, and he'll repeat it because he's an actor. But I think the Democratic Party needs to make a, have a recognition that right now, the base of the Democratic Party is so motivated, it's so turned up, they don't need policy, they don't need all this external, normal, political motivation. They will crawl over broken glass to vote against Donald Trump. They will kick down doors, they will, not, they, will, they will march through the snow to vote against Donald Trump. That's an advantage. That lets the nominee be somebody who's not from the edge, but more from the center. And the reality is, and I talk about this in the book, there's a big study called the Hidden Tribes. And Hidden Tribes basically, and I would have actually used the study that we performed under an NDA, but the Hidden Tribes is basically the same thing. It's basically the same artifact. It looks at Democrats across the country and they're not all hyper progressive. And it's easy to think, if you live out here, that they're all a certain political viewpoint. But a lot of them have different things that touch their emotional resonances and that, that, that motivate them in the states. You know, like in Ohio, there are a lot of Catholic pro-life Democrats still. They're, they're, they're not raging pro-life, they're not anti-abortion, they're bush rule, you know, rape, incest, life of the mother, but they are more pro-life than the average Democrat. And Republicans steal them all the time. They, they make lists of who they are in the voter file and go talk to them. And they say, you know, you may not agree, agree with us on this, this, and this, but hey, on the subject of, of, of abortion, we're together. And they're able to use that targeting and that strategy and that messaging in a very effective way. And it's just the cold-blooded mechanics of politics that the Democrats have got to get a lot better at doing really quickly. Uh, are there any Democratic candidates that you think are more in line with what you sure. w with, uh, with what's electable then because uh, I don't want to say like who would you vote for because that's you know that's not a thing but uh, but but who do you think is doing is doing the best I say this in the book and I really mean this I'm not trying to pick the Democratic nominee yeah but pick except for Bernie I, who, <laughs> I, who, I, who I who I think dooms the the scenario you literally call him Trump re-election insurance I also I, I believe I also refer to him as communist Ron Paul <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, but, but how does the party get rid of him? You say, you know, the, the, the big donors oh, should get together and, and say sure. no more money for well, people who, uh, you know, who aren't really... Unfortunately, Bernie doesn't, isn't influenced by that. That's what I mean. But so Bernie has a... Look, just like Ron Paul did for years, he knew he was never going to win the presidency. Ron Paul knew that for a generation he wasn't going to win the presidency. Why did he do it? He had an email and direct mail fundraising grift. Bernie's making a ton of money off this thing, and I know there are Bernie bots in the world who are gonna just slag my Twitter feed over this, but he doesn't really have a plan to win. And if you don't have a plan to win in politics, you don't have a plan and you don't have a chance. Bernie's like, it's like the underpants theory of, underpants gnome theory of Bernie. It's like, oh, I'll be the farthest left candidate, and then, I'll, and then they'll win, but they skip step two. Where's step two? What's the game plan to do that? Because. Part of it is, oh, we're gonna motiv motivate the youth voters. I have news for everybody. Young voters don't vote. Everybody thinks, oh, Barack Obama turned on the young voters and they all came out and he won because of that. Anybody have an idea what year was the peak young voter turnout in the last 40 years? The candidates were two sexy young dynamic men. They were Mike Dukakis and George Herbert Walker Bush in 1988. That was the peak youth vote turnout in the last 40 years. So the illusion of chasing that like young voter, college educated, or college campus vote, it's an illusion. You know why Republicans don't do it? Because math, because they know math. They know who votes. You know who votes? Old people vote. You know who votes in the swing states? Really old people. You know who votes in Florida? People who are like 80 years old and go with an oxygen tank and a walker to vote. But they vote. And so you go, where the, you go where the fight is. You fight where the fight is. You go and pick the fruit where the fruit's hanging low. Yeah, and, and, but it seems like Democrats are always trying to turn out the youth vote. I mean, there's, always, there's even this push here, I think, locally to uh, allow people who are 16 to sort of pre-register to vote um, and maybe even allow them to vote in certain local elections. I mean, there's always this, this real push or this hope that on election day, 
boing. I wouldn't trust a 16 with a 16 year old with a chainsaw, but that's another story for another day. Um, <laughs> that's true, but California, as you point out in the book, isn't. Well, look, know, I'm not saying you discourage civic participation in them. You just don't. Democrats don't have the money, and the time, and the resources, and the door knockers, and the bodies, and the lists to to go out and tag these people who are super low propensity voters when there's a huge pool of voters they know about that they can touch, that they can get to. Be, look, the Obama-Trump voter is a real thing. It's a real thing. Why were Democrats not working their asses off to get them back? And how do you get them back? You have emails from Barack frickin' Obama to those people saying, come home. I inspired you once. We can do this again. Yes, we can. You know, instead of trying to chase this dragon of, oh, we're going to get college kids to turn out in record numbers and then we win by some, you know, miracle. Because there's, yeah, this untapped potential right. that, like, they're just not inspired. And look, you can get low propensity voters here and there, but you ought to make sure that they check several boxes. They're low propensity for a reason. They're not informed. They're not easy to talk to. You don't know what their issue matrix is. Both the Democratic and the Republican parties have gigantic voter files. Every one of you in this room, I guarantee you, is in the voter file. And that voter file knows who you voted for, or not who you voted for. They know what party you voted for. They know what elections you voted in. They also bump up against your, your social media graph. They also bump up against your consumer buying habits, your magazine subscriptions, your, your tickets. If you've ever had a, you know, a, a interactions with the law, they know all these things. The voter file is a really rich, scary, terrifying profile of individuals. And it's anonymized. And by anonymized, I mean bullshit. Um, <laughs> but they know who to talk to. And it's a matter of disciplining themselves to talk to the right people with the right messages at the right time and not wasting resources and time. Like, and again, the, the story of California, I love y'all, but if a Democratic candidate comes to this state for any reason other than to drag giant sacks of money back east, they're out of their damn minds. Well, and, and actually, there's something that, that you talk about at the end of the book that I think is really important uh, in, in terms of especially the folks that I talk to who are um, conservative or on the fence. You talk about a, a man who was in a focus group mm -hmm. in Florida. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember this, you I want did. to tell the story, but, but I feel like what, what you write about what he said is really at the heart of the problem for Democrats. So can you yeah. tell us about that? The guy is a flipper, okay? He'd gone back and forth, Bush, Obama, you know, Trump. But he's the classic sort of Democrat who moved to the Sun Belt, and he feels like this world has changed so radically around him. And there's a great comfort in being told that your fear of this change, your fear of the rules. I mean, it was one of the stories of, you know, the guy's afraid to say the wrong gender pronoun. He's afraid he's going to get fired. You know, and this is a world that is hyper-exaggerated in some ways because you have Fox and the Republican message machine out there jamming this all the time. But that sense of alienation that those folks feel from, from the Democratic Party and that sense, that caricature of the Democratic Party as the hyper-progressive woke PC police, that has gotten very much into the heads and the hearts, even of Democrats in states like North Carolina, and Wisconsin and Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania. You're gonna hear me, I chant those states like a mantra all the time because they're actually the only states that matter. Um, but that idea that Democrats have to get back to being a party that doesn't seem like it's one homogeneous top-down thing directed from, a, from the tower in San Francisco, but instead can reflect the variations in in the political space that actually exists in the country, I think is a really vital thing. Yeah, he says here, um, I voted for Trump because he's a businessman and not a politician. And I feel like this part was really important. He said, I just don't want to be told how we should live. Yeah. And as long as Democrats are seen as, rightfully or not, you know, yep. sort of prescribing. Oh, look, and again, a it, lot of it matters what thoughts. they believe, not what's real. Mm -hmm. We all know there's no like PC Death Star out there. There's, no, there's nobody who's actually enforcing the gender pronoun rule and firing people in mass. But those guys believe it. And the fact that they believe it in politics makes it real. That's right. That's right. Now, I do want to ask a few questions here. Some of them I can't totally repeat. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but one of the questions here is... Um, I'll... 
I'm going to edit this on the fly. What is wrong with the Republican senators, and when will they ever grow a spine? <laughs> you know, John F. Kennedy wrote a famous book called Profiles in Courage. <laughs> I am sorely tempted to write a book now called Profiles in Chicken Shit. <laughs> because these people live in absolute mortal terror of two men, Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell. The control Mitch McConnell has over his caucus comes from the fact that he raises a butt ton of money every cycle, that he runs a great operational election system at the NRSC, and these guys don't want to be naked. They don't want to be out there in the wind all by themselves. They're also, the ones that are up for re-election, none of them have had their filing deadlines pass yet. So Lindsey Graham, the Miss Pity Pat of the Republican <laughs> Party, is all up on Trump's business right now because it's still about four weeks, five weeks before the South Carolina filing deadline. Because Lindsey's worst fear is that Donald Trump wakes up one morning and decides to go after him and hates him suddenly and says, South Carolina Democrat Republicans should vote for Joe Smith instead of that, that rhino loser, never Trumper Lindsey Graham. And everything about Trump, this pattern of behavior we've seen over and over again, he is loyal to nothing and no one except his avarice and his penis. <laughs> and Lindsey will be out on his ass and some cuckoo pants will come and run in the primary with Trump's backing and win. I mean, this is like the Roy, the Roy Moore problem. You know, there were plenty of decent candidates in, in Alabama, but Trump had Roy Moore in that race because Steve Bannon told him Roy Moore was the real conservative. What? You know, actually, if you want to talk about the, you know, I had a lot of Republicans when I broke in, the, in 2015 away from the party on the matter of Trump. A lot of people are like, oh, you're never going to work again. You're, you're done. And, and they were. They're largely right. I don't do Republican politics anymore. You're like, I guess I'll just have to be a New York Times bestselling author. I guess I will. <laughs> I will tell you, though, I will, I will tell you, though, um, being a New York Times bestselling, number one bestselling author, which never gets old, that's like rounding error being in the political consulting business. Political consulting, it's a good business. It, like, not a lot of work, honestly. Um, you've got to be smart about it, but, but it's... it's Anyway, the, but, but when I did the ads for a super PAC against Roy Moore to elect a Democrat, it was the first time I'd ever worked on any campaign that was going to elect a Democrat. Man, I slept great. It felt great because you know what? It proved something about how corrupted the Republican Party had become. And I'll grant you, it was Alabama, so, you know, it had a conservative overhang that was almost impossible to beat, and Doug Jones may not win again. But being able to run ads against a goddamn child molester, that was a satisfying moment. I, I, I mean, I enjoyed that shit. <laughs> on, on some high thread count sheets, I am sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you also talk about how, about, and let's get into like the fight part, because we sort of, there's, the book is sort of three parts. Yeah. It's, it's four more years of Trump, and then it's sort of, you know, what are the issues for Democrats, and then like how to fight against Trump. And one of the things you talk a lot about, is this going to be a TV election, not just because of sure. older voters in these swing states, um, but also because this is, uh, you know, it's just, everything's a visual medium, Twitter mm -hmm. only goes so far. Um, and you write, in terms of a debate, Right, you write, um, the only rhetorical tactic that will work with Trump is to hammer his ego and his personal narrative. Call him weak, call him poor, call him a failure, call him fat, call him impotent, say he overpays for sex, <laughs> and on and on. Which of the candidates right now do you think would be awesome at that? Oh, I think Amy Klobuchar, if you got her pissed off enough, she'd tear his guts out. <laughs> I mean. You know, I, I don't know if she's going to make it to the end, but that, you know, voters like to see some, you know, we, when you're in a dog fight, voters want to see some fight in the dog. And I, and I also think Biden has like old man pissed off thing, like old man pissed off energy, and could be to the point where Trump has just jacked his family up so hard that he goes at him. And Biden is a naturally affable kind of guy. But there is a little darkness to Joe Biden. I feel like Joe Biden may have killed a man at some point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my Lord. I hate you for making me laugh at that. Um, 
Um, what about uh, Elizabeth Warren? She always seemed to me like somebody who could really, you know, because if you think about, remember that debate where um, where Hillary Clinton's standing there and and, and Donald Trump kind of comes behind her, done, yeah. done. Uh, like, can you imagine like Elizabeth Warren? You know, what well, are you doing? You know, well, like, I, I actually, and I, I write about this in the book, especially if it's a woman candidate, and Donald Trump does his lurking monster thing he does, that 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 giant japer. <laughs> If it's a woman, what she should do is turn around and touch him. Put her hand on his arm. Pat his cheek. Donald, are you okay? Are you okay, Donald? Are you, are you, are you, are you, I know the signs of stroke, Donald. Are you, are you feeling okay? You know, just get up on him because he, isn't, he is not accustomed to that and he doesn't like people. He doesn't like contact with people. And whoever the Democratic nominee is, they need to be taken away for about a week locked in a room and debate trained and stage trained and given some damn acting lessons and have, have and look, I've done debate prep in presidential and vice presidential and US Senate and governor's races and every damn other thing. And you get them in a room and you lock them up and you watch them, make them watch the videotape of their own debates, which they never do. They never do. You get them in there and you make them conscious of their tics and their style, and you ramp it up, and you give them a better sense of who they need to be on that stage. Because I will tell you one thing about Donald Trump. He is a terrible shit tier human being in every other axis, but that man is a performer who understands spectacle, he understands where every camera in the room is at all times, he understands stage presence, and that counts in this election. We have a question here. What policy topics should Democratic candidates prioritize? None. For Zero. <laughs> None. There is no policy that will win this election. Nothing. You can promise people a billion dollar minimum wage and it won't win the election. This election is a referendum on Donald Trump. Policy is a trap. Donald Trump, if you, pre if you present this as a policy election, he will get the electorate to make a choice. Because if he, it's a choice between scary policy, and they will be made into scary policies, all of them. Everybody thought the Green New Deal was great, right, when it came out? Everybody thought it was great? You know what voters think of the Green New Deal? When you go to focus group, the first thing they say is, well, they're gonna ban hamburgers and airplanes. That's not true, but you know what? They all think it's true. And that is why policy is a trap. I know it sounds shallow and, 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 and demeans the idea of American voters as intellectual force. Yeah, guess what? No one decides policy on elections on policy. Donald Trump's policy, as I like to say, fit on a trucker hat. Okay? Barack Obama's policy fit on a poster. They, did, they, did they have policy papers? Sure. Did Barack Obama go out and say, my 600-page health care plan on page 417 describes how we're going to alter the payments? No. No, he did not. He talked about an alternative vision for the country. He talked about how he was the embodiment of that alternative vision for the country. So policy is a trap. Run from policy. But, but you do talk about how Democrats should highlight uh, the, out, the fallout from the president's trade sure. policies, for example, that these kinds of things will resonate with right. folks in the Rust Belt who potentially have been harmed by right. And those things, policy. talking about Trump's failures, talking about the things Trump has done that are failures for this country, and I mean both economic failures, like the trade war, which, by the way, the guy is so desperate to get the trade war in the rearview mirror, he basically rolled and gave Nancy Pelosi and Mexico everything they wanted in the USMCA. And he rolled on China and gave them everything they wanted. This whole thing about China buying American agricultural products, well, the main thing they're buying is pork. And the pork company they're buying from in America is owned by China. So we've given our farmers $30 billion in subsidies of money we borrowed from China for the Fed, and now we're doing a trade deal that actually helps a Chinese-owned pork company provide pork to China. It is miraculously stupid. Um, but how do they put it on a hat? How do you put that on a hat? How do Democrats put that on a hat? Like, how do you, get, you know, make, get a message out to, sure. to folks? Look, and again, this is where you target. You've got farmers in the Midwest who have gone bankrupt. You know, and, they, and, and those are people who voted for Trump. You know, the arc of, of, of he's a businessman, he knows what he's doing, to they just repossessed my John Deere combine harvester is present in Iowa and Wisconsin. 
But you think they don't know? I mean, they're not watching. And I would think they, if, well, you're, if, know, you're, if your income depends on soybeans, you could teach a class yeah. on international relations. Well, and at this point, mm -hmm. this is incumbent on the Democrats to get out there and work. This is why you have to go to Michigan, you have to go to Iowa, and you have to go to Wisconsin and talk to those people. I mean, Wisconsin is a state that has had, had a train wreck economically mm -hmm. under Donald Trump, even though the economy has been juiced by an unfunded tax bill and deficit spending and Federal Reserve zero interest loans and all these other things. We're on like a Coke binge in the economy right now because there's all this free money out there. And all that free money is benefiting Wall Street, which is a good signifier for Trump. He's gonna have a good economy on paper to run on. It's hard to run against the economy in this election. Yeah, because there are some people who, who have lost. I mean, some, sure. but, but for those who haven't, for those who go, you know, look, yeah, I know you guys warned us that this guy was a crazy person in 2016, but you know what? Four years have gone by. Nothing but you tangibly also bad in my regular life has happened. My 401k is doing fine. Like, why do I need to uh, vote for this other person when... Right. You know, the status quo is not ideal, Which but is whatever. one of the reasons why I emphasize that you have to go at the things that Trump has done as president that have benefited him, that, that are displays of his evident corruption. You have to go after things that are emotionally evocative, especially for suburban voters, who are, who, and suburban female voters in particular, and kids in cages in every focus group I've seen. You do the kids in cages issue in what we call a dial group, where they're watching a news story and they've got a little box and it's like, uh, from one to happy and 10 to upset. Kids in cages is a solid 10 upset. They do not like it. It is an evident fact of his cruelty and his, and, his, and his xenophobia and his racism in their minds. There are a lot of things that he's done behaviorally where you can make a case to folks that you're gonna, as a Democratic candidate and nominee, you're gonna be different. You're not gonna be cruel and capricious and, and go after you know, people who are beneath and below you in a whole variety of categories in ways that just look like egregious dickery. <laughs> that should be a slogan. I, uh, I could fit that on a hat. Vote for me. No egregious dickery. <laughs> That is it. But are Democrats doing that? I mean, you, you write in the book about how one of the things that's very, very powerful that, that focus groups show is very powerful is the issue of pre-existing conditions in health care and eliminating barriers to that. Uh, and the fact that the Democrats have sort of overshot that and gone into single payer, et cetera. I mean, are they are they picking up on these nuances? Or are they sort of going too far? There are some folks in the Democratic Party who believe that a trained monkey can beat Donald Trump. They are mistaken. Those folks also believe that what America is waiting for is for the aristocrats to be hauled off to the guillotine. And this idea that, you're wait, that, that there's this gigantic, hyper-progressive group out there dying for single payer in the Midwest, it does, it's, the evidence doesn't show that it's there. Now, when Obamacare came along, we studied the healthcare question rather closely. We did a series of 32 focus groups in 16 states. I was on the road a lot. Every single place I went, this is in 2009, when we got to the subject of pre-existing conditions, everyone, and I don't mean like one or two people that were accepted, every single audience in every single focus group had a story. My cousin, my husband, my wife, my father, my mother, black, white, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, evangelical, Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, everybody had a story. And we went back and wrote a big report for the group that paid for it and said, if this becomes a debate about pre-existing conditions, you will lose this argument about health care, you will lose it forever, you will lose it till the end of time. And guess what? When Donald Trump accepted the first bill from the House of Representatives when he, after he was sworn in, it was the quote-unquote Obamacare repeal bill. It did not repeal Obamacare, of course, but it did take away coverage for pre-existing conditions. It was the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And I believe the phrase that I used to a certain former Speaker of the House was, why did you stick your dick in the toaster? <laughs> that is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And, and this idea of pre-existing conditions being taken out is also present, it's embedded in the Trump legal fight to repeal Obamacare. You know, Obamacare was deeply unpopular when Obama was president. The only person that could make Obamacare popular was this goddamn moron. And he did. 
because pre-existing has become a definitional part of it. So why are Democrats arguing for single payer or Medicare for all when they could stick to the one thing that they know and we know drives the vote? Pre-existing is a winner. It, it is a absolute cut. And you put Republicans on the spot at every level of the ballot and say, hey, you want to repeal Obamacare and that removes pre-existing. And when they say, oh, but I don't, I'm going to, uh, what bill? There is none. There is nothing there. It is a gigantic vulnerability for the Republicans that is begging to be exploited. My God, if I was on the other side of this thing, I'd just be like eating their lunch on it every day. But, you know, Tom Perez. <laughs> By the way, why did you stick your dick in a toaster? Potential book title? Yeah, it could just be. Saying. <laughs> just saying. Um, Maybe don't stick your dick in a toaster. Lessons from the 20 teens. There you go. <laughs> I'm buying the domain name right now. <laughs> Um, do you worry, I have a question from the audience, do you worry if Joe Biden is a nominee, he'll be turned into Hillary Clinton by people like you? Here's the thing. For 30 years, Hillary Clinton was the subject of one long, endless negative campaign. Endless negative campaign. 30 years. From 1992 on. Was it deserved? No. Now, look, Hillary has many sterling qualities as an individual. She's smart. She's accomplished. She's a terrible politician. Mm -hmm. And she got so brittle over the years because she got beat the shit, all the, beat the shit beat out of her all the time. Fox was always at her. Her husband was always doing things that embarrassed and humiliated her. I mean, that, that worked out well. Um, and all these things sort of accumulated around her as this, this shell. And so the genuine person, you, it was really hard to drag it out of her. She was always very defensive. There was always, you could see the gears in her head. Any People would ask her a question like, did you like that sandwich? It would be like, tick, 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 tick. you know, <laughs> should I calculate this? How should I answer? What, what emotion should I display? And so that made it even easier to turn her into this creature, this, this harridan and this Machiavellian shrew that the Fox audience loved that story. They loved that storyline. And they loved trying to, I mean, so when you got to the point where it reached absurdity, Hillary Clinton's the center of a global child pedophile ring based in a pizza restaurant. There were people in the Republican Party who were like, well, of course she was. Because that stands to reason. She's part of George Soros' international lizard person cabal. Yeah, they believed this lurid craziness because they've been prepped for it for so many years. But Joe does, Biden's but, a different kind of character. Now, but look, but doesn't he have a lot of, I mean, you talk about op, oppo research here. Sure. I mean, I mean, he's been in the public eye for a long time. I mean, there's yeah. potentially a lot there. And I'm not saying it, you know, the, the, it detracts from what the president did, but his son, and I mean, it's kind of sketchy over there. Look, Joe Biden, like any character in this play, is an imperfect character. There is no generational superstar in this race. Democrats have had three generational superstars in the last 50 years. JFK, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama. They were the greatest natural politicians in the last 50 years. Bar none, dot com, over and out. On, e on either side, by the way. On either side. None of these people are of that quality. The thing about Biden is that his quirks are kind of a known quantity in the minds of the voters. They don't fear Joe Biden as somebody who is particularly evil or venal. And the message that Trump is using about Burisma and Hunter and all that, it doesn't move the numbers outside of the base. That's a base retention strategy for Trump. That's not expanding his base. That's not trying to get independents and moderates. That's a, that's a, I say this in politics a lot. Don't do bank shots. They don't work in politics. People do not go from A to Q. They go from A to B. They go from maybe A to B to C on a really good argument, but they don't go to these Baroque, you know, well, this happened and then that happened and then this thing and then that thing and this other thing. It doesn't work that way for most voters. And you also say that the Clintons should stay away from the convention. Yeah. And also um, AOC and Bernie Sanders, that Democrats should I know a lot of people love AOC. Of Her numbers suck, okay? They're terrible. She's a two to one upside down with voters out in the country. She's a specific flavor, and a lot of progressives adore that specific flavor, but it's like, it's, it's like people who like kimchi. 
it's a particular flavor. I happen to like kimchi, but some people like it, and some people think it tastes like cabbage that's been rotting in a toilet for six months. <laughs> a lot of voters out there in the country are turned off by her, and it's a combination of factors. It doesn't make it a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a thing. Her, her favorable, unfavorable numbers are upside down. Basically, two to one unfavorable. That's like Mitch McConnell. But, and there are plenty, look, it's, it's like, on the right, people adore, some people adore, guys like Matt Gates or Jim Jordan. They think they're firebrand, you know, they're the fighters, the scrappers, they're the future. And there are people on the left that adore her. This is not a race about the big picture right and left extremes. It's about states in the middle of the country that are not particularly woke. If you want to get AOC to work, and I say this in the book, put her to work. There are plenty of places she can go and do turnout operations and plenty of places she can juice up the progressive vote where you, where you want that, metropolitan areas. But if you make the Democratic Convention a centerpiece of you know, calling for the workers' paradise, it's, gonna, it's not going to turn out the way they, they expect. Uh, and you say that, that, uh, that the Obamas should actually be featured, that they should stay away from the Clintons, sort of in yeah, one, look, on one side, and then the AOC and Sanders on the other. The Clinton, and then... Donald Trump wants this race to be, Crooked Hillary's back and trying to take me out. That's what Donald Trump wants. He's scared of the Obamas. God, he, just, he thinks about the Obamas, and he gets weak in the knees. He thinks about the Obamas, and he's screaming for Dan Scavino to bring in the Depends. He does not like the Obamas. He is scared to death of their charisma. And I'll tell you the core secret of it. They're bigger celebrities than he has ever been. He's always been a D-class, E-class, hustling grifter with the New York Post, page six. They're global celebrities. They're the real deal. And the Democratic Party in 2016 made an enormous mistake by sidelining them. An enormous mistake. They should have had Barack Obama out busting his tail, and he probably would have done it if he'd been asked, and he wasn't, wasn't out there to the scope and degree it was necessary. If they make that mistake this time, they're going to earn what they got last time. Last time, a five-point-something percent drop in African-American turnout. Hillary Clinton's campaign modeled that they were going to get less than Barack Obama did, but they modeled they were going to get about 0.6 less than, they, than, than Obama did. Well, they got about 5% less than Obama did. That did not work out well for them at all. And if African-American turnout isn't worked hard, and by the way, if you can't get African-American turnout back up to where you need it with President both sides from Charlottesville, a guy who wouldn't, who wouldn't condemn David Duke, you know, your, your party better, you know, better check out and, and find other work because this should be an easy lift, but they've got to dedicate the resources to it because African-American voters have been taken for granted and they turned out with Obama twice in record numbers, but it, that magic doesn't hold unless you work it. And Hillary did not sufficiently work it. Is, do Democrats have an issue with promising, we have a question here about Democrats promising things to black voters and black voters feeling sure. like, you know, we may be Democrats, but we're not getting anything. That sort of both parties are equally useless. I mean, isn't that part of what the issue is with, with turnout? I think that's part of it, but I also think that Barack Obama as the first African-American president and presidential candidate of, 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 as a nominee, that was a unique cultural moment for the African-American community. And and I think that it's one of the reasons that whoever the nominee is needs to think really hard about the VP slot. It's either got to be somebody who works the Midwest or it's got to be somebody who works the African-American community. One of those two options, I think. And maybe those aren't mutually exclusive, but I don't have a name that would tick both boxes. Yeah, I've got a lot of questions about this. And I'm just going to ask you and let's just get this over with. Will you say a name of, Democrat, of a Democrat primary candidate who you think is doing a really good job or a really crap job and not Bernie Sanders? Okay. I think Warren is the most improved candidate in the field from where she started. And that's necessary, but it not necessarily sufficient. I think she and Bernie have suicided each other. I think they've, they've mutually assured destruction. Um, I think Biden is a rising force, and it's rising because of two things, name ID and the perception he's the strongest candidate against Trump. 
I think Pete Buttigieg is one of the smartest people that's in politics in a long time. He needs another turnaround. He needs another office somewhere. He's not quite there yet in terms of gravitas. Very smart guy. I like smart people. I've met him. He's a very bright guy. Enormously promising. Um, I have a, a soft spot in my heart for Amy Klobuchar because you know why? She's not super polished. She's not super sophisticated. But man, she's got some scrappiness to her and that fight in the dog. You can see that, and she's, she's trying to grow into being that fighter, and it's kind of great to watch. See, I think, I think differently. I think that she is a fighter, and she's actually up there trying to be cool. You know what I mean? You know, when, she's when the, when she's the, actually trying to be a little more polished than she is, and, right. but she's got, that, she's got that in her. You know, when the, when, the, when the Trump people were losing their minds over that story about her you know, with her staff, and they were like, oh, she's out of, emotionally out of control. I sent a person who knows her a note, and I said, the line she should use is, Donald Trump, you can call me a bitch, just get it over with, you're gonna in the end anyway, but the only person I'm gonna be a bitch to is you. And <laughs> I, I just, I, I, there's something about her that I find very appealing, and part of it is the calculus of the Midwest, and her cultural connection with states like Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, or Iowa, um, and part of it is that she's not out there doing, you know, 4,000 page policy papers. Um, look, again, they're, all these candidates are flawed. Everybody's flawed. And, and what about Bloomberg? <sighs> okay. Mike Bloomberg, between the time he got in the race and Iowa, will have spent 300 and some odd million dollars. Let's call it 300 million dollars in round numbers. Mitch McConnell, for the whole U.S. Senate, for all the Republican Senate races, is gonna raise about $200 million. Now, would you prefer to burn this money on a bonfire of your own vanity <laughs> and hit 15% and it doesn't seem to be moving? Maybe it will, but it st seems stuck at 15%. He got, a, he got to 15% after spending about $60 million and moved since then, so something's going on. Or would you prefer to spend that money to win the US Senate? Because you know what? You win the US Senate and Donald Trump is in the White House, it's a whole different world. It's a whole different universe if Mitch McConnell is the minority leader of the U.S. Senate. So I'm, I'm a little irritated by Michael and Tom Steyer, who don't have a plan for victory. They have a plan to spend a shit ton of money, but they don't have a plan for victory. And, I mean, Steyer is... He's all in on South Carolina right now. He's looking for... The, they're all looking to short-circuit the process. Bloomberg and Steyer. Why do you suppose Steyer thinks South Carolina that uh, we're both Southerners? Yeah. Um, you know, South really, Carolina where they like really care like about climate change. <laughs> they're going to be like, come on, old billionaire with your, right. with your plan. There's nothing talk. I've been wanting more than a billionaire to come down here and tell me how to live my life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, why? I, I think it's an odd choice. For it me. is, it, but strategically, Mike Bloomberg has a very narrow path for a number of reasons. He's trying, he's not in the early states, he's trying to win a big, a big kill on Super Tuesday and then accumulate delegates elsewhere. That's a narrow pathway. That's a, that's a stunt campaign, not a campaign with a plan from A to Z. So, uh, can he be the nominee? Donald Trump was, but does Mike Bloomberg have a plan to spend that money enough to get enough delegates in a party that is skeptical of him. He's a former Republican. He's very abrasive. I haven't gone into a focus group and talked about Mike Bloomberg. I haven't, I haven't asked that question, but I've done enough of them to know. The Mike Bloomberg affect includes a feeling of being lectured to mm -hmm. and talked down to a little bit of, I'm a billionaire, I'm smart, I ran a city, I did X, Y, and Z, do what I want. Um, I'm not sure that's gonna sell, but we'll see. Look, we, we actually are in a very weird spot. We're in a sort of a black box. We've never had a candidate that's actually spending this much money before and who could keep spending it till the end of time. I mean, remember, he spent $200 million. That's 0.001% of his net worth. Mike Bloomberg could spend a billion dollars a month between now and election day, he'd still be worth fifty billion dollars. As to say, that is real money. Of what you're just saying. Uh, so, but uh, what about Kamala Harris? I mean, she's a local gal. She I know she sure. dropped out. But what do you? What's your diagnosis of what what happened there? 
So the analogy I use with her, and I'm not a huge sport ball guy, but the analogy I use with her is she's like one of those hitters in baseball who has like a 200 average, but occasionally comes up and just knocks a grand slam out for the back wall. So then one debate where she came in and just took Joe Biden's head off, danced around the stage with it, and threw it on the ground and kicked it out of the, out of the rafters, people thought, well, she can do that again, can she? Well, if you got a trick like that, and it's an impressive trick, you better be able to pull it off on demand in politics. Because the next debate was flat. And the next debate was even more flat. The next debate, she had a little bit of life back in her, but she just didn't get a consistent style and a pattern of winning. And when you're doing a campaign based on your personality, and, and I thought her presentation was fantastic. I, I thought she was, I thought she was a possible great, and she just couldn't do all the things at once. She could occasionally deliver on the debate. Her fundraising was kind of anemic. Her campaign was disorganized. And unfortunately, you gotta do the mechanical things. I talk about this in the book. You gotta do the mechanical things of organizing a campaign and running an operation. Because remember, a campaign is a startup. A campaign is a startup. You get one day to sell your product in the, at the end of, this, uh, of the cycle of the product. That's it. You can't do what tech guys do. You can't do the scale fast, fail fast thing. You've got to scale fast and, and not fail. So she didn't scale and she did fail. So that, I mean, I don't think she's done in politics by any means. And I think she learned a lot of lessons in this thing. And, and again, her presentation is really terrific. Uh, we have a question from the audience here. Um, do you think that Trump will refuse to debate and what would happen, his Democratic opponent, of course, and what do you think would happen then? I don't think he'll refuse to debate because Donald Trump, the most dangerous place in the world is between Donald Trump and a TV camera. <laughs> he, will, he, will, he will find it irresistible to be on that stage because he always thinks he's gonna win and he thinks he knows the, the, the game of reality TV well, better. Well, he skipped than... one of the Republicans' debates, I mean. Yeah, but at that point, at that point, Trump's ego, in this, in this thing, Trump's ego is so big. And, if, and the question of, of, of a bully is always this. It relies on their reputation for invul invulnerability. And so if it's Joe Biden or Amy Klobuchar or whomever, and they're able to say, oh, Donald Trump isn't on the debate stage with me because he's a chicken shit, it will drive him out of his damn mind. He will lose his mind over that. So I, I, don't think, I don't think he feels like there's any danger of losing on a debate stage. And so he'll be drawn to it. It's also because moth the flame. Uh, I have a question here. How do we, I assume Democrats, counter Trump's lies? So Trump tweets something. Fact checking is a thankless business. Daniel Dale is a damn international hero, okay? But, but it is a thankless business. And the way to get rid of, to get past his individual lies is to always frame him as a lying liar who lies. I mean, get to the point where you're not talking about, not debating him on like what the growth percentage in the economy is. It's Donald, you lie all the time, you lie like a cheap rug, that's it. We know you're lying. We know that the, the, you know, you, if you get in a fact debate with Donald Trump, you're losing. You just have to frame him as a liar, frame him as somebody who can't help himself, who's pathologically unable to tell the truth, and move forward from it. You, it fact checking, it, as a Democratic candidate, fact checking him moment to moment is a fool's errand. But wasn't the Clinton campaign criticized for focusing on him and sort of saying, well, you can't possibly elect this crazy person, as opposed to putting forth a positive, um, a positive narrative? Isn't it, again, the, all the she's criticized for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. I don't know if that All the legitimate. deficits Hillary had, even if they had done that, I think were, were offsetting to, you know, trying to do an affirmative strategy. And their strategy was not failing. Their strategy was working. It, it had moved the numbers significantly in North Carolina and Virginia and even Georgia, but they took their foot off the gas and they had part of it was they got distracted by Comey and all these other things. They took their foot off the gas and they slowed down their ad buying, which is the fatal flaw, in Wisconsin and Ohio and Michigan and where else? Pennsylvania. Um, and Trump won small numbers 
in those states. He, didn't, he wasn't trying for a home run. He was trying for a single, and he got it. Well, let's talk about impeachment. Because you do say in the book that you, that that's you I, I, that you wrote, I assume before yep. this all happened, that that this is a bad idea, that Trump's going to fundraise off of it, and that yep. it, the better idea is to sort of slow walk a series of investigations. So, what do you make of what has happened so far? So, I turned the draft of the book in uh, in mid mid August of last year, and my publisher was like, "This is it." No more changes. Absolutely. We're done. No more changes. You can't do anything else. We're not going to add or subtract anything. This is it. Final copy. And of course, Ukraine breaks like a couple days later. So I had to wage a gigantic hissy fit. And <laughs> they were very good about it. And they, they really, we, we, we were able to keep the schedule, even though I had to rewrite some of that. I'm a skeptic about impeachment because of two simple words. Mitch McConnell. Okay. Donald Trump is going to come out of this thing deserving to be impeached, deserving to be removed from office, deserving to be dragged to the street to a prison cell for the rest of his miserable, fat life. But <laughs> Mitch McConnell is going to save him. And he is going to go out and say, no collusion. I was exonerated. And he's going to go out there while this is going on, as he has, and he's going to raise, I, by the time this is over, I, I believe he'll probably raise around $250 million off of impeachment. Because the Rubes that are his supporters, they're red, they, they believe, an awful lot of progressives and liberals believe that the minute the House impeached him, Donald Trump would be out the door. We polled it. It scared the crap out of me. Because they, the, uh, uh, about 40%, well, 36% of Democrats believed that once you impeach him, he's gone, he's out, he's done. Oh, don't get me started about our civics yeah. education in this country. But just on the same token, Trump's base believes that any moment now, George Soros' stormtroopers will drag Donald Trump from the Oval Office if, as long as this impeachment goes on. So they're very motivated, and they're giving and giving and giving, and every time their disability check comes in, they're clicking that little button. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say something? <laughs> you, you realize, by the way, that why Donald Trump doesn't talk about entitlements very much? That's his base. That's his base. He doesn't talk about the, what, what Republicans used to talk about reforming entitlements because his base is on Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and Disability. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a class truth about his, his people. Anyway. You don't think Democrats have a similar? Oh, they have a similar, yeah. But, but Donald Trump's base, they're the ones with the sign that says, keep your hands off, keep government hands off my Medicare. Okay. All right, let's work how that works. But you know, the, the question of, of where do you go in a broad sense in the campaign at the end of the day, uh, and I know we're about to have to wrap up here, yeah. but the idea of, of communicating Trump as this, as this figure who is so far outside of the, of the social norms of our country is really underpinning this whole thing and, and getting back to the fact that he is corrupt, that he's crazed, that he's evil, that these things, and I use the word evil advisedly, but I'm sorry, if you have a policy of deliberate cruelty that ends up with children being put in cages, fuck you, you're evil. Yeah. Did, the Demo Did the Democrats make a mistake in impeaching? Well, impeachment- In the House. Impeachment in the Ukraine situation, I believe, was merited. This is an absolute example of the corrupt abuse of power to gain personal political benefit by using government resources and government policy in order to benefit your campaign. If there's not a clear-cut case for impeachment here, I don't know what it is. Now, that still doesn't get you to two-thirds in the Senate. And you were never going to get there. Seriously, and I, I mean this with all sincerity, they could have Donald Trump admitting to being a child molester, and you will not get two-thirds in the Senate. That's how scared they are of Mitch McConnell. That's how scared they are of Donald Trump. And that's why the, th the, the project we're doing, the Lincoln project we're doing, we're going after Trump's enablers in the Senate. We're gonna put them on notice. We're gonna go after those people because if you enable evil, you're evil. If you enable criminality and corruption, you are a person who is a co-conspirator in criminality and corruption. And so the impeachment will have a net neutral benefit to the Democrats, but it will have a net positive benefit for Trump financially and in terms of his base retention. 
Well, we have time for just one more question here, and I think uh, it's one we can all leave with. And it says, uh, for residents of states not in play for 2020, well, like California, um, what should we do with our time and money to influence the election outcome? This is a great question, and one I, 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 a friend of mine last night mentioned this to me. She said you should end on this on this note when you talk to people, because a lot of people don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. And every person in this room has six degrees of separation on your social media with people who are in a swing state. I guarantee you, you know people in a swing state somehow, some way. Some connection through family, friends, school. Somehow your connections ramify out to Florida or Alabama or Georgia. Or move. Or, or, or the usual <laughs> tier states that you've heard, you're sick of hearing me say now. But somewhere you know people out there. Look, if you've got the means, go spend a weekend in Pennsylvania. Go knock doors. Go knock doors. If, you've got the, if, you, if you don't have the means, get on the sign-up list for the voice over IP thing. You do it from your computer. It's just like Skype. And they will give you phone numbers to call in those swing states, and you just read them the message. They're going to they're gonna do all the work for you. All you got to do is be the person. You say, hey, I'm John, and I want to talk to you about the fact that, here in I, that, that, that a lot of people in Iowa, just like you, have been really hurt by this trade war. We need to change. Or you, go, or you make calls into Arizona. I really want you to know that um, you know uh, that it's wrong to put kids in cages and it's wrong to treat Hispanics like they're all criminals. Yeah, you know, they're going to have messages and they're going to have systems for you to use. You know, there are a lot of things on social media and on direct uh, direct door knocking and direct public advocacy that people can do. You don't have to go there if you can. I will say this: we've studied this a lot. One of the secret sauce weapons of Barack Obama in two thousand eight was they deployed actual people to go knock doors in swing districts all over this country. And they built a system to do it. And you know who reverse engineered it a couple years later? The Koch brothers. They reverse engineered it, they studied it, they decided how to do it, and they put it to work. And the Republican Party has now inherited all that operational mechanism. They're gonna do that. They're gonna go into, into white male Democrats and knock on their doors and say, they're coming to take all your guns away. They're going to go into Catholic neighborhoods in Ohio and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin to Democratic households and say they want abortion in the third trimester. Do you agree with that? They're going to go do that personal touch campaigning. You guys can all be a part of that. You can be equally engaged. There are a ton of tools. The campaigns of the party are going to have a ton of tools out there to allow you to engage. And personal advocacy in campaigns trumps, sorry for that word, almost any other thing. Personal contact is a powerful motivator. Well, everyone, there is so much more to know. There and I think is we so did that with like explore. three F bombs. Um, I feel like you know maybe was, six was minimum. Maybe somewhere in there. NPR will be thrilled. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> our minimal use of the F bomb. Uh, Alrighty, so I'll remind you that copies of Rick's book are available for purchase. Of course, just outside the room, and he is going to be signing as many as he can before he has to run off and catch a flight um, in just a couple minutes. So many, many thanks to Rick Wilson, New York Times best-selling author. You're amazing. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> and I'm Melissa Kane on behalf of myself and the Commonwealth Club. And Rick, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Good as a gavel.